Ross King is the highly praised and best-selling author of Brunelleschi's Dome, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling, The Judgment of Paris, Machiavelli, Philosopher of Power, and two novels, Ex Libris and Domino, born and raised in Canada. He now lives outside Oxford in England. And you've just won the Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction, Leonardo and the Last Supper. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. Great to be here. First of all, how long did you spend with this genius and what was it like? I spent altogether five and a half years. Uh, but having said that, I did do other things over the course of the five years. Uniquely for me, I was multitasking at the time. My wife says I'm no good at it, but this Mara is this is proof no. to the opposite, <laughs> exactly. right? Yeah, so I was doing uh, my book and the group of seven at the same time, and the two of them overlapped a little bit. In the end, I did spend a good three years doing the research and, and writing for it. And what was it like? I mean, it's just so stimulating reading about him. Well, he, he was a stimulating character. Everyone who met him was dazzled by his brilliance. And he didn't always achieve everything that he wanted to achieve or that people thought he could achieve. And he walked away from quite a number of commissions and left them smoldering behind him and also left litigation trailing him as well from disgruntled clients that he had. But everyone recognized that he was something special. And so it was fascinating to immerse myself in his life, in his times, and then look at how he fit into the political and social milieu of Florence initially when he was a younger man and then Milan by the time he's 30 and arrives in the, the dukedom of Milan looking for work with, with the Duke Lodovico Sforza. And by this time he's, he's not old by our measures but by the standard of the day he's run his course at, at 42 or thereabouts. That's right. And feeling that he hasn't accomplished anything. And in some ways he hadn't. I think had he died at 40 or 42, we wouldn't be talking about him. He would be a footnote in history of someone who showed tremendous p potential, but never really achieved it, uh, which is, I think, hard for us to imagine. We think Leonardo was a polymath genius, and of course he could turn his hand to anything and succeed almost effortlessly at it. And without taking away from his accomplishments, I think you have to recognize that he spent much of his 30s on projects that didn't come to fruition. Um, I did discuss one of them in the book, the bronze equestrian monument that he was doing to honor the father of the Duke of Milan, but all sorts of other things, that, including paintings that he had been hired to do, and then was for one reason or another, and it's not often clear what the reason is, mm -hmm. he didn't complete them. Well, the irony with the horse is that, uh, as you point out, the, the horse was going to be positioned in a prominent place, so I think he probably liked that. But then he had come to Milan to exercise his mechanical military genius. That's right. And the bronze was eventually, what, melted down to make cannons. That's, that's why he wasn't able to finish his work. That's right. There's a horrible irony for Leonardo. He At 30, he left Florence, where he'd done his apprenticeship, um, and he came to Milan, and it's 1482, and he's hoping to be commissioned to design and build weapons of mass destruction for the mm -hmm. Duke of Milan. Because the French had such. That, that's right, and the, the French were arming themselves with very formidable weapons, but sadly for Leonardo, happily for everyone else, Italy was at peace in the 1480s, and Lodovico Sforza, if he saw Leonardo's designs for giant cannons or crossbows or chariots that had scythes on the wheels that would decapitate the enemy as it, it rode through the ranks. If Lodovico saw these, he ne didn't take Leonardo up on them because he didn't need them. I Italy was peaceable at that time. And so what Leonardo did end up doing for Lodovico was this giant equestrian monument, which was going to be absolutely spectacular. It was going to be cast in bronze. It was going to be a monument showing the first Sforza Duke of Milan, Francesco, who came to power in 1452. It was going to show him astride a horse. And the horse alone was going to be 23 feet high. And this was going to make Leonardo's reputation as world's greatest artist. Not only the greatest living artist, but the greatest in history, because no one had ever even attempted something of this magnitude. Um, that's, and he spent the better part of 10 years on it. Unlike so many of the things he walked away from, he did not want to walk away from this. He was in deadly earnest about completing it. And then, of course, in 1494, what he had been waiting for for about a dozen years finally happened, and war breaks out, and 
the French come streaming across the Alps. There are 30,000 of them armed with these fearsome weapons, cannons that could be moved very rapidly and destroy castles. And Leonardo, I think, is hoping to be tapped on the shoulder by Lodovico, who will say to him, build me the giant crossbow that you had in mind and we'll wipe out the French who quickly become enemies of Lodovico. Uh, But in fact, Lodovico taps him on the shoulder and says, I need your 75 tons of bronze that you're just on the brink of using to create the giant bronze equestrian monument. To to build cannons that that aren't even up to the task. That's right. And so Leonardo might have hoped that, okay, I'm losing the horse, but I'm getting the cannon commissions. But he doesn't even get that. And the bronze floats down the river to Ferrara. It's confiscated from him. um, And it's sent off to Ferrara to be turned into cannons in the foundry there. And so you can sort of imagine Leonardo standing on the riverbank, uh, watching the bronze <laughs> float away, and with it his dreams of creating the statue or of being a military architect. Are you injecting this vaulting ambition, or where's the proof? No, not at all. Leonardo talks about wanting to create a, what he calls a work of fame, and he clearly wanted to step up into the pantheon of great Italian artists, architects, sculptors of the... 14th and 15th century, he's aware of everything that's gone before him because at about the age of 14, 15, he came to Florence from Vinci and he would have seen adorning Florence things like Brunelleschi's dome on the cathedral, the doors of Lorenzo Ghiberti on the baptistry. He would have seen all of the statues by Donatello. He would have seen frescoes by Giotto in the Church of Santa Croce. He would have seen the work of these immortal artists. And it's absolutely certain that he wanted to join them because he says at one point, we ought to desire the impossible. And so he knew that someone like Brunelleschi had achieved his immortality a couple of generations earlier by desiring to do the impossible. And in many ways, his horse was his response to that, his equivalent of it. And so, yes, he had tremendous ambitions. He certainly wanted to make his name, not only in Milan, but he wanted it to resound widely across Europe. Uh, So that must have made these ongoing failures that much more bitter in the mouth. Yes, because if you think about it, he's been working the better part of 10 years on this commission from you know, essentially 32 to 42. The best years of his life he's, mm. he's given to this project and it evaporates almost overnight at the point where he was ready to begin casting it. So what he ends up with then is a kind of consolation prize, which is in the autumn of 1494, when he's at his lowest moment emotionally, Lodovico does tap him on the shoulder, but it's to paint a wall in a dark, narrow room where a band of friars eats their lunch every day. And painting is something that he, in his heart of hearts, didn't want to do. It pays. He left that behind, right? That's right. And in many ways, I think what he was doing when he moved to Milan was trying to reinvent himself. At the age of 30, he decided he hadn't finished a number of works in Florence. And in some ways, he had blotted his copybook or he'd fouled his nest. He couldn't work there anymore because he had a bad reputation as someone who would take the money and run and then not finish his work. And why he wasn't finishing them. The positive aspect of it, I guess, is that he was a perfectionist. He wanted to get it absolutely right. He wasn't content to do what he had done before, what other people had done before. He always wanted to push the boundaries. But there was maybe a more pessimistic side to that, a darker side, which was that in his heart of hearts, he didn't want to be a painter. He didn't want to work for obscure bands of monks outside the walls of Florence who wanted him to do an altarpiece that only the obscure band of monks would see. He wanted to do something that was very, very public. Everything he saw in Florence, Brunelleschi's dome, the sculptures of Donatello on the cathedral, the bronze doors of Lorenzo Ghiberti, all of those were things people could see from the street. They could come out of their homes and look up and see them. And that's very different than an altarpiece outside of Florence, which was the adoration of the Magi probably the most famous work that he walked away from. And so I think he wanted to reinvent himself in Milan as a civil engineer, a military engineer, someone whose name was on the lips of everyone as the man who could save Italy in her hour of need or save Milan. But that call never really came. And I think he was disillusioned but still actively seeking work in the 1480s. Later in life, he's just disillusioned and he's kind of given up hope of ever being able to do that kind of large-scale 
public project. So does he see himself as a failure then at the end? Well, what's in some ways heartening for all of us is that yes, in, in many ways he did. But it's also sad to think that he mm -hmm. didn't feel he had accomplished everything he was capable of. At least in his lifetime, was he feted as a great painter because of, of The Last Supper? Yes, The Last Supper made his reputation. Okay. Um, and what I discuss in, in the book is just how vital The Last Supper was to his career because, as we've been saying, by his early 40s, he had failed to achieve anything public and visible. And I think it seemed to him when he got The Last Supper commission that this was not going to be the sort of work that would do it for him. In the first place, because uh, he didn't want to work as a painter, and then secondly, he had never worked in fresco. And when someone says to you, I want you to paint a, a wall or a vault in the, the 14th or 15th, 16th century, what they're really saying is, I want you to paint a fresco. And fresco is a very particular technique calling for very complex logistical procedures. Leonardo did not train in it and had never worked in it. Plus, you have to do your thing in an X period of time before it dries up, right? That calls for a specific kind of talent that I assume he had, but as you say, he had so many. And the talent that he didn't have was the one to work quickly. And when you worked in fresco, the whole secret of it was speed. Speed was of the essence. Uh, because what you had to do is paint on wet or moist plaster. And so every morning the plaster would come in and begin slathering, troweling the plaster on a very confined space, maybe five feet wide by three feet high. And you would then, as the painter, work on that particular field over the course of eight, 10, 12 hours, whatever it took the plaster to dry. But you had to get your pigments onto it before it dried. And the beauty of that was once the pigments were on, they were there for good because they chemically became part of the wall. But you just couldn't go back to it, you couldn't rethink it. It's all about it. Exactly. Well, if you chipped away at it and repainted it, a word for it is pentimenti, or repentances. You would repent what you had done the day before. But to repent what you had done, you had to chip it off the wall and, and get the plaster put on again and, and start all over. So this was not a type of art that was congenial to Leonardo's talents. And so, as I discussed in the book, he doesn't paint it as a fresco. If someone ever describes The Last Supper as a fresco, you should quietly and modestly correct them and say, no, it's not a fresco because it was not painted in this particular technique in which you are using pigments diluted only with water that are added to the moist plaster. What he did instead was to paint on a dry wall with a combination of oil and egg tempera. And every single painter's manual of the 14th, 15th, 16th century said, whatever you do under no circumstances should you ever paint on a dry wall with oil or egg tempera because it will flake off. And of course, that is what happened to it. But before that happened, uh, you were asking about did it make his reputation? And it did, partly because of the fact that he is Leonardo da Vinci and is, is such an incredibly talented painter. But secondly, because of this technique that he used. I mean, he thought he could arrest, he could stop the flaking off of the paint from the wall by finding the secret recipe. Well, that's so much like him, isn't it? He's going against convention. In fact, you point to his flamboyant dress and his disregard for fashion yes. as a, another element of his personality. Yeah. And I think that's a very appealing part of his personality, someone who didn't do things by the rules. He had to experience it himself, right, to prove it to himself. That's right. And he just didn't want to repeat. He took nothing on faith. Uh, he took nothing on the authority of the others. He always wanted to try for himself. And I think that's why he's such an interesting person, not only an interesting artist or an interesting engineer or architect, but in just plain interesting as a person. He was someone who plowed his own furrow and so, you know, mistakes were made along the way, and including the technique in The Last Supper. Despite all of the oils that he ground up and experimented with, his notes are full of descriptions of grinding up uh, nuts, pine needles, trying to find the magic solution that's going to stick to the wall. In the end, it didn't work. But what it allowed him to do was to work on that 30 foot wide by 15 foot high surface in a way that no one had ever worked before. No one had ever been able to have the level of detail and just the sheer beauty of what Leonardo created 
on that wall of the refectory. Um, and so it caused a sensation. And his star suddenly uh, was in the ascendant, and he was seen as having achieved everything that he was capable of achieving. Probably everyone but Leonardo thought he had done so at that point. And then suddenly the commissions started coming, and people were interested in getting him to work for them. The sad commentary is that he may not have been fulfilled doing that kind of work. There's a point a couple of years after he's done The Last Supper where an agent from Isabel d'Este comes to him and because she has asked for a portrait of her and Leonardo doesn't really want to do it but he makes a half-hearted start at it but then leaves Mantua where she is and goes to Florence and about a year later she's getting a bit impatient and so she sends an agent to Florence to find out what Leonardo is up to and the agent comes to see Leonardo and writes a letter back to her which is really fascinating for what it tells us about Leonardo's studio and Leonardo's aspirations and basically the agent says to Isabella look you are not going to get your painting and in fact she never did um, and he said Leonardo is tired of his paintbrush he doesn't want to work at painting mm. and someone else just before that said whenever Leonardo should be working on painting He's working in geometry, architecture, and anatomy. Um, and so you think he had just created The Last Supper, which at that point, I mean, it, it's still probably the most famous painting in the world. If it's not the only serious competition for it, it's the one he began in 1504, but never really, never handed over to the patron, died with it still in his studio 15 years later, and that's the Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, and so these two comments come sandwiched between these two great works of art. And I think what they tell us is that he, in his heart of hearts, didn't want to be a painter. He was striving for the impossible, as you say. That's and, right. And, and that kind of person is driven and never satisfied. He wanted, always wanted to push the boundaries. Yeah. And Which again is so appealing, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's right. I think he was one of the greatest portrait painters that there ever has been because he, even before the Mona Lisa, he did two, I think, the two great portraits of the uh, 15th century, which uh, the Geneva de Benci portrait, which is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and then the Lady with an Ermine, the uh, portrait of the mistress of Lod Lodovico Sforza. And he transformed portraiture with those two paintings, and then the Mona Lisa as well. How did he do that? Well, usually you showed a woman in profile. Female portrait was usually done as a pendant to the, the male portrait. There would be the man and the woman. And the woman would usually be on the left, which is the inferior position. Any traditions like that, Leonardo completely gets rid of. Uh, even if it's in his contract, what it's supposed to look like. He didn't want to be exist. told what to do. That's right. Yeah. He knew best. And in fact, when one of his paintings was uh, questioned, and not the content of it so much as how much he was paid, by a confraternity in Milan who had him paint a Virgin of the Rocks. They didn't know that's what it was going to be. They said, what we want is a painting that you'll do in oil, which we hear is a new technique and very exciting. We want you to do it because we've heard good things about you. And what we want you to do is paint a God the Father at the top, then have the Christ Child sitting on a golden platform, the Virgin Mary standing below that, and then add a couple of saints for us. And Leonardo was this to exemplify the Immaculate Conception? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's it. Because they're the confraternity of the Immaculate Conception. And uh, so they want Leonardo to do a painting which will represent it. And that wasn't really accepted in the, in the faith. That's right. It? it was very controversial. Yeah. And it was supported by a number of people within the church, including the Pope of the time, who was Sixtus IV, who was a Franciscan. And the Franciscans supported it. The Dominicans didn't. And so there was the great battle between them over the Immaculate Conception, uh, you know, which is whether or not the Virgin Mary was born in sin, her parents. And so Leonardo is given propaganda for this very recondite theological idea that he may or may not understand and he's not really not interested in. Um, and he produces this majestic painting. I think it's probably safe to say it's the greatest panel painting of the 15th century, the Virgin of the Rocks, which is now in the Louvre. I mean, it's a mesmerizing work of art. And the confraternity seemed to have been happy. With, they said, put some rocks in it for us, but you know, maybe a rocky background. And Leonardo created this grotto that the action takes place in. But he didn't pay a blind bit of attention to the contract and what they asked for, because of course he shows the virgin and child with John the Baptist and an angel in this ethereal setting. So when he fell out with them, they were bickering over things, mostly the cost of the painting. 
um, he wanted a bonus and they said no we're holding you to what it was and he, he said but I've spent all the money on materials alone I have no profit and they said tough um, and so he, he then says blind men cannot judge color um, and he, he, he thought they were ignoramuses about art, mm. which they may well have been. And so, yes, he redefined everything when he came to it. And so how he redefined female portraiture is he created living, breathing women. Showing them some respect and perhaps elevating their place. Ex- and, and literally elevating their place because the Mona Lisa, of course, has the landscape in the background, mm-hmm. and he's showing her she's a, a housewife from Florence. Uh, you know, whatever theories there are about who it might have been, Lisa del Giacondo, nay Gerardini, wife of a silk merchant in Florence. Uh, but he doesn't show her in a domestic setting. He puts her in a, a rather fantastical setting mm-hmm. outside of recently. An it- Italian geologist um, you know, has been studying rock formations and has said that she's found where what Leonardo puts in the background. Uh, but I think a question like that is less interesting than the mere fact that Leonardo has put her there, that he's taken her from the home, and he's not showing her merely as the wife of a wealthy silk merchant. He's created her as a being in her own right and put her up against a wonderful landscape. Was that one of the first paintings that showed perspective? Well, yes, um, it, it isn't the first that shows perspective, but perspective is very new at this point. Mm-hmm. It was really developed earlier in the 15th century by Filippo Brunelleschi in cooperation in art with Masaccio, the great painter who did die tragically young at 27. What Leonardo was interested in was not just single point perspective, which is where you play a kind of trick on the viewer. There's an ideal viewing point for it where all of the perspective comes right. Leonardo was less interested in that than what he called aerial perspective or the perspective of distance, where he says, if you are showing a landscape, have the mountains in the foreground, show them very clearly, and then he has a formula. For every five miles back, make them a fifth part lighter or add more blue to them. And so you have these blue hills in the background. And one of the first ever paintings he's known to have worked on, An Annunciation, which is in the Uffizi in Florence, is the best example of the perspective of distance you can ever find because he shows a mountain range in the background and you have mountains close up, mountains in the middle, mountains at the very back and he's shaded them so that you have this sense of a landscape receding into the distance. For us that seems very natural now, it's something you learn on day one of a landscape class, but before Leonardo people had not done that. The Mona Lisa, everyone is always fixated on the figure of the woman because she is so beguiling and and painted so wonderfully, and yet in the background there's a marvelous landscape. And he was one of the first people in Italian art anyway to be mesmerized by the landscape. So much of the Italian landscape is beautiful and dramatic and scenic, and yet painters were not interested in it. Michelangelo, for example, younger contemporary of Leonardo, was utterly uninterested in landscape painting. It's a tribute to his curiosity and his, his multi-faceted exploration of the world he lived in. That's right. He was interested in the landscape on all sorts of levels. And in some ways, the artistic level, how to paint a landscape, is only the upshot of all of these other interests, which begin with the geology of the earth. He certainly did climb hills around Milan, or he climbed in the Dolomites in northern Italy uh, and left notes about his mountaineering. He was one of Europe's first mountaineers and climbed up to see, he wanted to see what the sky looked like from that height. Yes, it was a different color. That's right. And so he, he was just relentlessly inquisitive. It's easy to imagine him as a child in this little village outside of Vinci, wandering around and looking at the landscape, studying it. And the first thing we have that he produced artistically is a landscape drawing. And that's all it is, a landscape. It's sometimes called the first time someone in Western art uh, became interested in the landscape for its own sake. Without any figures in that's the background. That's right, because yeah. it's often done as a kind of backdrop, but there's no interest in it. It's just a bit of green space and a couple of hills. The background <laughs> is something where a battle scene or something else is going on. Something so important. Probably painted by the young apprentices and the, the master himself had no interest in, in doing that. You write in the book, and the book is Leonardo and the Last Supper, and I'm speaking to Ross King. The fact that he was, quote, illegitimate wasn't looked upon with any kind of judgment back 
uh, in those days, and he was, by your account and others, happy, and he was loved, and so that obviously contributed to his makeup. That's right. There's no question that he was born illegitimately. His father, who was a very ambitious young notary, had him by a mysterious woman. All we know is that, really, is that her name was Katerina. And um, she, I think, undoubtedly came from the lower orders, was, I think, a, maybe a cleaning woman of some sort or a servant, if not in um, Leonardo's father and grandfather's house, in one of the neighboring houses in Vinci, and as I discussed in the book, she may even have been a slave. There were mm -hmm. a lot of domestic slaves, young women who had forcibly been brought over from the Caucasus region, for example, um, or from North Africa. And it may well be that she was one of them. Many of these young slave girls were impregnated by the master of the house or the master's children or a neighbor. In some ways, there wasn't a huge amount of shame in this for them. They are sometimes allowed to keep the child. More often, the child was adopted out. He couldn't be a lawyer, though. Yes. The interesting thing about being illegitimate is that two avenues were barred to you. You could not become a lawyer, and you could not become a priest. And I think for Leonardo, that was no hardship. I don't think he wanted to be a priest very badly. No. And I don't think the legal profession really appealed to him either. Well, and yeah, he didn't really want to do what his father did. That's right. right. For five generations, the family had been notaries. And in fact, Leonardo's father became a very successful lawyer. He was the lawyer for the government of Florence and for all sorts of monasteries. And he was the lawyer for the Jewish community in Florence, which was not inconsiderable. So he had to think of another profession. And there is a tradition of people who were illegitimate in Florence or in Italy in general around this time who went on to do wonderful things, partly because of the fact that they... Some had, of the great artists. That, that's yeah. right. Leon Battista Alberti, one of the great architects and polymaths, and in some ways the Leonardo just before Leonardo. And so I think Leonardo happily was taken to the studio by his father, to the studio of a, a sculptor and goldsmith, Verrocchio, who was probably the greatest goldsmith and sculptor of his generation and a great teacher. Father apparently showed Verrocchio the drawings that the young Leonardo has made, and Verrocchio was suitably impressed by them um, and said, yes, I'll take him on. And so Leonardo stayed with him for about 15 years, which is a very long apprenticeship. They mm -hmm. sort of collaborated. They got along, didn't they? That's and, right. And, and he was an intelligent, creative person. That's right. There's a very interesting list of possessions in Verrocchio's house, I think from the late 1470s, early 1480s, when Leonardo has either been living with him or has just left to set himself up on, on his own. And the interesting thing is that many of the things, including the books and there's a, the map of the known world, the, exactly the same things were in Leonardo's studio, musical instruments as well. Verrocchio, I think, was a very aesthetically sophisticated man who had a great sense of design and was inquisitive. Um, and I think he's not given enough credit for shaping Leonardo, because Leonardo was a country boy from Vinci. And I say this is a country boy myself. And Leonardo had come up to the, the big city of Florence with its 30,000 people in it. And so Verrocchio, in some ways, molded his aesthetic sensibility um, and awakened his interest in things like mathematics and the way to use mathematics in design and in sculpture, both in marble and terracotta, and then also crucially for Leonardo's career in bronze. Um, and so Leonardo had, a, I think, the, the best education he could have had. What's interesting is he stays with Verrocchio for so long, which indicates A, that he got on with Verrocchio, but B, that he loved studying. He's someone who stays in university for yeah. many years and does degree after degree yeah. because he's absorbing absolutely everything and trying to learn all that he possibly can. And he also worked for the Medici That's family, right. too, which, which puts you in a pretty rarefied environment That's as well. right. Very early on, I think, it was spotted by everyone just how talented he was. And so he had patrons from the absolute upper level of Florentine society, and then beyond Florence as well, because a Venetian nobleman is the man who wanted the portrait of Geneva de Benci, who was his either his mistress or the woman that he sort of saw as the ideal woman. And then the, the King of Portugal as well commissioned a tapestry from him, and he created apparently a wonderful design, but alas, like so many things, never quite got around to finishing it. 
and it never ended up with the Flemish weavers or whoever would have turned this into a tapestry. But in the end, when we look at this, in his 20s, he had the King of Portugal <laughs> wanting work from him. Uh, I'm reading Steve Jobs' uh, the biography. By Walter and, Isaacson. Yes. There's a couple of bells that ring. One is that his biological father was Syrian, and so there's that mixture yes. of hybrid of blood. And the fact that his father, the father who adopted him, loved to tinker with cars and engines and used to go out to flea markets and find bits and pieces of engines that he could fix cars up with so that he could sell them for money which eventually went toward Steve's education. Apparently those skills, particularly the idea of going out and hunting bits of circuit boards that he could find and he knew he could turn into money. Well, that whole sort of apprenticeship with his adopted father, <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I'm sure there's theories about how genius is spawned. Have you come up with any kind of overriding theory about genius? As I wish I could find it. I wish I knew what it was. There seemed to be intangibles. I think you could take someone and give him or her exactly the kind of education that Steve Jobs, or put him or her in exactly the kind of situation and not get the end result. Verrocchio was a great teacher and had numerous students, but he had only one Leonardo da Vinci. There was something that this impossible to figure out on that personal level and then even if we widen the debate a little bit why did all of this happen in Florence what is it about Florence in the 15th century that produced Brunelleschi, Donatello, Ghiberti all basically in one generation uh, and then Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and before that you have Dante was it something in the water? What was it? And yeah. Economic historians have studied the luxury economy in Florence. When Leonardo turned up in, in the 1460s, the city had 75 goldsmith shops. And so there was a whole tradition of working with materials and thinking about design. And it also had statues everywhere, these revolutionary statues created by Donatello and Nanni Di Banco and people like that, which are on the exterior of the building or San Michele, just south of the cathedral. And so you could sort of get an education walking the streets or putting your head in the goldsmith shops. But a lot of other cities had luxury economies as well. And mm. they had wealth and they had patrons who were relatively enlightened. I mean, the, the Medici were very important to the Renaissance in Florence because of the fact that they wrote the checks for all, so many of the, these things that we now celebrate. But I think you can take that scenario and transplant it to another city or see it happening in another city. And you don't have the Michelangelo or the Leonardo or the Brunelleschi or the Donatello. And so I think what we see happening there is overdetermined. There are all sorts of things occurring which encourage it and nurture it. But there are also the intangibles that you need someone with the brain of Leonardo, who I think, yeah. think had an absolutely unique brain and who could have been transplanted to another venue, another era. And it's hard to imagine that he wouldn't have been everything that he was in Florence. There has to be that, that opportunity to flex your capabilities, I suppose, but also this insatiable curiosity and the desire to make a name for yourself. I think there's a lot to be said for a kind of hothouse atmosphere where you have a, to mix the metaphor, a critical mass, uh, where you bring people together and ideas are bouncing off each other. And, and you get an apostolic succession of master to apprentice, apprentice becomes master, has another apprentice, and knowledge is, the, the torch is passed from one generation to another. And, and the that, ability to spot genius that's too, right, early. That's right. So it's a function of many things, and I think when it happens, it's truly wonderful. Uh, I think it, it's to be celebrated when it happens and you want it to last. Yeah, and you want to try happen. and make more of it happen. That's right. And I think what happens is like Silicon Valley now, talented people go there and yeah. it's like Florence in the 15th and 16th century became a magnet for all sorts of great artists. Early in the 16th century, a boy from Urbino turned up in Florence looking for work, looking to learn um, and actually got his hands on Leonardo's drawings. and made copies of them and studied him um, and kind of absorbed him at a nuclear level. And that, of course, was Raphael. And so you, you have all of these people coming from far and wide to Florence to either learn at the feet of the master or just walk the streets and breathe the air and absorb what's going on there.
And Raphael, his portrayal of Plato as model. Yes, Raphael knew Leonardo da Vinci oh, okay. and uh, or met him at, and had access to his studio. Yes, I discussed in the book the School of Athens, the great painting that Raphael did in the Vatican a dozen, 15 years after Leonardo painted The Last Supper, has Plato uh, in it. This character of Plato is pointing, and this seems to become a Leonardo signature, okay. the pointing finger. There is the theory, then, that it is uh, a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. The idea is very appealing. I, I think if Raphael knew more about Leonardo and his way of working, he would have portrayed him instead as Aristotle, I think. <laughs> Just if, uh, in closing, a couple things. First of all, our program is called The Bibliophile. So I wonder if you could speak to Leonardo's love of books and lists. Yes, yes. Leonardo once called himself a man without letters. And he said, erudite authors can make fun of me because I'm not well read. I trust what I see and what I feel. This was a kind of shield he seems to have used throughout his life. That, oh, shocks, I don't read those difficult, serious books up on the shelf. I get out, get my hands dirty, and I study for myself. And it's, to some extent, that was true, because he did get his hands dirty, and he cut up bodies. For, he was an anatomist. He Cut up lions. Th that's right, yes. He anatomized animals, and he cut up 30 humans. You know, he wanted to peer inside the human body and not just take the authority of Galen or someone previously about what the, the human body was like and what the, the function was. He wanted to, to know for himself. But having said all of that, Leonardo was a reader, a serious reader. In the 1490s, early 1490s, around the time he started The Last Supper, he owned 40 books. And maybe we think 40 books isn't a lot, but books are a new technology, developed only recently in, in Italy, in, really in Leonardo's own lifetime. Um, and a decade later, he draws up another list of his books, and he has, I think it's 118. So over the course of a decade, he bought whatever that makes it about... 70 books or so. And books were expensive. Uh, they were a luxury item. They'd come down in price since the printing press came in. But he obviously liked to read. And what fascinated me was what he was reading, because it wasn't just things that we might expect him to read, like Pliny the Elder and books by the ancient Romans. And Leonardo, incidentally, tried to tr teach himself Latin uh, long after he was a schoolboy, because he wanted to be able to read these books in Latin. And he actively hunted down a lot of them. And it's very interesting to see him make himself a memo about, you know, there's a, an apothecary on this street in Milan, and he has a copy of <laughs> such and such a book, and I'm going to get my, I'm going to borrow that from him. And he had a library card, it appears, for the library in Pavia. Uh, but it, he had not only the serious scientific works, but also he had Aesop's fables. He had books of funny stories. So he was quite well-rounded in that sense, and he planned to write books himself. First and foremost, a treatise on equine anatomy. Sadly, that's been lost. He wrote a treatise on painting for the edification of his students, which was never published in his own lifetime, but which has subsequently been published many centuries after the fact. Um, and then he, I think, clearly intended to write a book of funny stories. I think Leonardo was an ideal dinner companion. If you talked about the latest book he could talk about with you. He seemed to know about politics in Milan because, of course, he was at the court. He ought to play the game, too, didn't he? It wasn't that he, he was destitute. He made quite a bit of money. That's right. He, he doesn't ever really complain about money. There's an interesting point, though, when, when he thinks this guy has a really good face and possibly his face is going to appear in the, a, a painting. The guy worked in a pawn shop. He writes this note around the time that he loses the commission for the bronze horse, and I started thinking, I wonder if he was in financial difficulties at that time and pawning something. This guy, Cristofano, that he mentions, worked. it was a high-end pawn shop that was frequented by the nobility when they, were, they fell on hard time. Just in closing then, finally, can you just reflect on how his life and his approach to things has affected your life? Good question. I think studying someone like Leonardo or a number of the other people that I studied, like Michelangelo, Machiavelli, or Brunelleschi, who are all unquestionably geniuses. They were great men, and in some cases in many fields, and they all achieved a lot. If I answer the question about Leonardo, but this is true to some extent of the other ones, it's heartening to see 
that they struggled through the same things that everyone else has to. We imagine that life would have been so easy for Leonardo because he was so talented and he was also very charming and personable and he was also extremely good looking apparently. He seemed to have it all and yet he did have to struggle and life wasn't always easy for him and he got rejected. I mean that was one of the things that made my jaw drop that Leonardo had to deal with rejection because he wanted commissions and so the um, cathedral in Piacenza decided that they wanted a new set of bronze doors and Leonardo sent his resume to them um, and said that he could do it and gave a plan and you think these guys in Piacenza are going to say my god how lucky are we to have Leonardo apply <laughs> for this job but they didn't they said no nope, sorry we're giving it to someone else and so I think for anyone and that's all of us anyone who's ever been rejected for a job or for um, uh, well, for that, that huge novel. disappointment too. I mean, that, the, the, the horse. That's right. What a huge disappointment Absolutely. after ten years yeah. of toil. Yeah, and that has such a parallel with Michelangelo as well, because Michelangelo got the vault of the Sistine Chapel as a consolation prize for not being able to do his dream commission, which was the tomb of Pope Julius II. And what amazed me in both cases is the way that they dealt with the terrible blow of not being able to work on what they had wanted to work on, being given something that they really didn't want. And yet what they do is, when they realize they can't get out of this other commission, they do their best at it and achieve something that really is earth-shattering. And so I think it's very heartening to read the way that they dealt with this, and that, yes, they, had, they were knocked back by it, but they then picked themselves up. And so I think if even Leonardo and Michelangelo are rejected or things don't work out for them, you know, we, we can take heart at that and then try to follow their example of keeping calm and carrying on and doing the best that we can at what we're given, even if it's not exactly what we do want to make our name in. Maybe fame for us will come in a, a very unexpected and roundabout way in the, exactly the same way that it did for them. Thanks for writing the book. Thank you. It's a pleasure to write. And if people enjoy reading it, I think they're just sharing in my enthusiasm for Leonardo. Thanks again. Pleasure. I've been speaking to Ross King, who is the highly praised best-selling author of Brunelleschi's Dome, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling, The Judgment of Paris, Machiavelli, Philosopher of Power, and Leonardo and the Last Supper, which has just been awarded Canada's Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction in English.